My name is Luz Hanifa. I'm a Welcome Senior Clinical Fellow based in Newcastle University, where I'm also Professor of Dermatology and Immunology. Um, my job combines primarily research, which is about 80% of my job, and 20% of clinical work, where I see patients uh, with skin diseases. My primary and secondary school education was in Malaysia, and I did a Malaysian uh, A-level equivalent, and then, you know, came to medical school in Cardiff. So I didn't really go through the British education system, so I went straight to medical school here. And during my five years of medical training, I took a year out to intercalate medical biochemistry, which was super exciting, and that's really where I got the research bug. Uh, and thereafter did clinical work initially in Adams Hospital in Cambridge, uh, a sh very short three months stint in Nottingham, and then up to Newcastle where I started my specialty training in dermatology, and during which point I took out of program research um, funded by Action Research uh, for a PhD, and thereafter you know went on to do a welcome intermediate uh, clinical fellowship, and then a welcome senior fellowship. So as a dermatologist, I have a very strong interest in skin. I also um, started working uh, on, on genomics, mainly transcriptomics, and then blended that in with skin and also the immune system, and then more recently developmental biology. So this is going to sound terribly vague, but somehow my research uh, is involved in studying the developing human immune system, and how the developing human immune system subsequently shapes uh, our postnatal uh, life and protection, and also how it may actually have a role in disease. And one of our recent findings shows some of the developmental pathways that we saw in embryonic skin re-emerging in two common inflammatory skin diseases, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. For me, it's the sense of discovery, the ability to sort of find new things and look at a clinical problem and what may be causing a clinical problem in a completely different way. So what I found is when I do my clinics and I listen to my patients, I'm trying to think of what may be going on at a cellular and molecular level that may be causing you know, the, the, prob the skin problems that they have. Uh, and, and being able to figure that out and to try and think you know, differently is really amazing. And for the developing human immune system, it's really like, you know, exploration, outer space exploration. Every, every cell is like a new planet, a new galaxy that you discover. So it's really fun. The greatest challenges is basically juggling, being a researcher, being a clinician, being a mother. Um, and that's really tough. Um, but I think as long as you kind of know what, what skills you have and what skills you don't quite have and try to get support for all, all three domains at you know, your research work, your clinical work and at home. And that, that, that really helps. Some of the challenges that I found more recently is to try and convince people that diverse representations is an asset for any organization or any research program. Because generally the view of diversity is very much based on equal participation. So it's about equality, but in truth, diversity brings much, much more than just equal participation. We are stronger, we are more innovative. We will produce a lot more by embracing diversity. And that's something that I really want to promote so that you know, it's, it's clear that the reason to do this is really a positive outcome for the organization or whatever program. I think the biggest misconception is that only certain people can do it. In truth, you know, most people can do it. It's a question of whether one wants to do it and also for, uh, for others whether they can actually, they have the opportunity to do it. And I say this because one, one of the kind of like a track to become a clinical academic is doing an intercalate degree during your medical school years. 
and then entering an academic foundation program and an academic clinical fellowship program prior to um, undertaking our program doing a PhD. That's kind of like your first phase of research. But some people may not be able to kind of intercalate whether it's financial or other administrative reasons, or be eligible for the AFP and ACF programs for various other reasons, including, you know, administrative reasons, visa requirements, for example. And as such, while this um, academic tract is extremely helpful and beneficial, because it sort of like allows you to sort of um, focus on being becoming an clinical academic, we need to think of ways to diversify and also enable other individuals who may not have had the fortune to participate in this sort of like uh, academic track to, 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 to enter clinical um, academia at some point. Uh, and, and we need to think of ways of how we can widen participation uh, into clinical academia. Believe in yourself, you can do it be ambitious and work out what are the what, what the people around you who can help you to get there and what is around you that is going to enable you to become a clinical academic. I mean, there's a lot of evidence now that actually goes to show that, you know, um, academic hospitals have better um, clinical outcome for their patients you know, in this sort of like uh, CQC assessments. And that's something that, you know, Newcastle University uh, and Newcastle Hospitals Foundation Trust uh, can actually demonstrate very well. I think it's linked to diversity because if you kind of like um, pursue a clinical problem in a very singular way, i.e., you know, learning about the symptoms, the signs and what you're meant to do, you know, you can do that, and I think that's great. But if you don't actually have the opportunity to question perceived wisdom or think about how could we do something a little bit differently and do better, what is the actual understanding of what's causing this disease? You know, is this diversity in thinking about clinical problem that can only be, you know, addressed by having clinical academics as well as, you know, uh, many other kind of like input from allied healthcare professionals and so on. I think the uncertainties are also different for different people. So there's a lot of uncertainty, for example, uh, particularly for women who want to have a family and then go part-time training uh, and that prolongs their clinical training but also prolongs the time when they are without funding and you know, being credible as a clinical academic. So I think those are, the, the uncertainties are very different. So the, the, the key thing I, I feel is, you know, really know what you want in life and you know, work out what are the support measures, uh, not just the kind of like organization, but also your family, uh, your um, the people around you, your peer support group, and the uh, more senior researchers around you, go seek help, get their advice, and get their pointers, and then see what works for you, uh, and leverage everything. I mean, I I've, I've used all of those to help me support uh, the uncertainties in my career, um, and it's going to be quite unique and personal. So I think in addition to individuals taking their own initiative to try and reduce the uncertainties in clinical academia, there's a lot that can be done, uh, particularly from funders and the institutions or organizations, you know, in trying to sort of like make sure there is a buffer uh, and there is a kind of more secure uh, training route. Uh, and also to sort of make sure that research time is really protected uh, and that those individuals are not being asked to do too many things. Uh, and, and you know, essentially having to juggle family research and clinical work. I think we need to be pragmatic and we need to be supportive. And then we will see the results being far greater than by just asking people to do more. The appeal of clinical academia is the ability to have freedom in how you think and how you 
pursue a problem um, and, and being able to sort of like collaborate, you know, learn new things. It's, it's a bit like a fantastic learning journey from so many people. Well, not necessarily other clinical academics, but you just suddenly find yourself uh, being exposed to so many things uh, that you never knew existed and that would change the way you think uh, and how you approach clinical problems. I hope the biggest impact that I've made in my career is to try and demonstrate how clinical uh, medicine uh, and research in biomedical research in general can really move or accelerate its sort of um, implementation and output by people working together collaboratively in a safe, secure and supportive research environment.